Football Night in America podcast. We're back. I'm a little nervous for this one because we've had all Football Night in America people. And like when your brother comes on, it's kind of you take on that pressure. You're the one who invited him. You told everybody he's great. Let's have him on. And I, I don't know, like, are you going to live up to the hype? Are you like, we got Jason McCourty here from Good Morning Football, NFL Network, all the good stuff. Welcome to Football Night in America, man. I appreciate it. You should be nervous because I'm a little bit of a wild card. You, when you bring your teammates on, you kind of know what to expect. You're around them all the time. So you kind of know their demeanor with me. You don't know what the hell I'm going to say. So you got to be a little nervous and, and have and see what's in store. So the fact that they deal with you every single day, it should be a breath of fresh air having me on the podcast. Well, you know, I've done this with Chris Sims. So anything is okay. on the horizon when you're with Sims. Simsy. Speaking of being a wild card, Wild card, free agency, all of those good things. Good morning, football is moving to LA. Football Night America podcast here. Football Night America, highest rated TV show. We're all for breaking news. If you want to let the people know Jason McCourty's plans, will he be in LA? Yes, no, maybe so. You're not even you're not even gonna take me on a date first, warm up, get to first base, second base. You're just gonna come in and swing right for the yet. fences. There's a, there's a, there's a, personnel. a, I know my yeah, personnel. I, I need all so that. I'm, e so I'm easy. There's a lot going on uh, with Good Morning Football right now. Show's picking up in LA at the end of July. Um, the plan is to be a part of Good Morning Football. That capacity, all of those details, all of those things are being worked out. So there's absolutely no breaking news. The only way I'm breaking news, you said NBC, you said the highest rated show, all that blah, blah, blah. I'm not employed. So unless you're saying, hey, NBC, we're trying to hire you on to stop you from going to L.A., I didn't hear any of those words or the authority that you have to do so. So what's the topics that we're getting into today? Yeah, that's above my pay grade. But uh, <laughs> now you want to jump all in. So in NFL news, we have the Houston Texans, Nick Casario, D'Amico Ryans saying, you know what, we're going all in. They trade for Stephon Diggs and – there's a lot to do with this, right? Stefan Diggs, you trade for him, and then it comes out, you trade for him, but you void the rest of his contract, so he just has this year. So there are some people who are like, this is a bad trade. You come out, you get him down to a year. What happens in this year? You don't get any security. I like the trade, and what I like about it is it is very Bill Belichick, New England Patriots, however you want to say it's the idea we get this player – and we're going to swing for the fences because we think this player could be the difference in losing in a divisional round and winning the divisional round and being in a conference championship competing with Kansas City. So I think the Houston Texans, I think they sat, they met, and they say, hey, there's an opportunity to get digs. We don't know if this is going to be a long-term solution. Let's get this guy in our building first. Let's see how it works. Hey, are we going to pay him a lot of money this year? Yeah, we have a $3 million raise. But if he plays at the level that he's played at, we're just in the wide receiver market. We're not going above and beyond. We're in the market. We're doing what every team does that has a solid, solidified, number one type of receiver. And I think they're also like you add him with Nico Collins. You add mm -hmm. him with a Tank Dell coming back this year. We give more weapons to our stud quarterback. And now let's just see what happens. So I know everybody isn't all for the trade. I saw uh, Ross Tucker had a, a – talking about the trade and the different smaller details he wasn't a fan of. But I, I enjoy the trade because I think in this league, when you know there's a top dog in your conference, Kansas City's the team to beat. Yeah. You have to sit there and say, can we beat them? Yes or no. If the answer is no, what can we do to try to win? Let's not just be happy with losing a division around again and making it a closer game or something like that. Let's go and try to win a Super Bowl. And I love what Houston did. And you got to look at it. Houston saying, you know what? We feel like we're a team that can compete and go out there and win a Super Bowl this upcoming season. We're not waiting. We're not building for the future. We feel like our time is now. And that goes back to the theory of you look at the Super Bowl this past year. You have Brock Purdy playing on a rookie contract and there's weapons galore around him from Debo Samuel to George Kittle to Brandon Ayuk to Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. And you look on the other side, you have Patrick Mahomes who signed one of those big deals. So the Tyreek Hills and the different weapons that he's had throughout 
about his early stage of his career, they're not there. But Mahomes has enough to be able to get them over the hump to go back to back on Super Bowls. For Houston, you look at this entire offseason, you add Diggs, but that also included Joe Mixon, Daniil Hunter, where a year ago, Nick Casero was kind of going with those one to two year deals. They re-signed Dalton Schultz as well. And it was those smaller deals of just kind of we're getting some guys in the right mix, the right culture. And now this year we're going all in and we're trying to bring guys that, to your point, are game changers and almost franchise changers. And somebody like Stefan Diggs, there's a lot to be said of people that don't know him, us in the media, people on the outside, they're like, well, this guy has a bad attitude. If he gets to Houston, what if Nico Collins is getting the ball a lot? What if Tank Dell's getting the ball? What if they decide to hand the ball off to Joe Mixon too much? Is he a guy that's going to have a bad attitude? I look at it as he got to Buffalo and instantly Buffalo, Josh Allen took another step forward. I'm not going to say Josh Allen wasn't already a really good quarterback. We played against him with Beasley and John Brown and all of those guys, and he was still a dog out there. But Stephon Diggs helped elevate him to another level. You bring somebody in like that with the work ethic that he has. And think about it. Already we're seeing all these videos on social media of him wearing the Houston Texans helmet and all of that. So when you talk about wiping out the last three years of the deal and giving him a pay raise, there's this thought of, all right, we're going to get the best version of Stephon Dix, who has never played on a contract year. At the same time, you're getting the best version of them. So say we do make it to the AFC Championship game if you're the Houston Texans and you fall short. Now, next year, you've given up your second-round draft pick for Stephon Dix, who may not be on your roster. And you talked about Ross Tucker talking about it. They don't get a comp pick as well because they shortened that deal. So there are some things within the minutia. I look at it as throughout my career, I played 13 years. For most of my 13 years, probably at least 10 of them, you could say nine of them, we were not trying to win a Super Bowl. The offseason, the moves we made, yes, management, coaches, it just didn't make sense. You're a player in the locker room, you're like, all right, like, I got to figure out, I'm trying to make a Pro Bowl, I'm trying to do some things, like, we're trying to get better, but re- reality sets in, like, we don't have enough to win a Super Bowl. For the Houston Texans, they're saying, no, we think Stefan Diggs helps us to get there, so we're making that move. So from that side of it, I like it. I am a little nervous that this guy, he's not going to be on the roster, and now you're losing a second-round draft pick that you maybe could have went and got another receiver to compliment C.J. Stroud as well. So it's going to be more about how he fits in because all the stuff we heard between him and Josh Allen, there had to be some truth to it. I mean, they ate $30 million in dead, in dead cap to trade him. So there, to me, you, you move a guy, it was almost like, yeah, even if he wants to get traded, I, I don't care. I'm the general manager. If it doesn't work for us, I'm not doing it, but it seemed like for them to go but ahead you and talked make- about it, And you talked about it as the season was coming to an end. You look at Stephon Diggs last year, I think the first five out of six games, he was over 100 yards and then never had a 100-yard game after that. I think you have put out a tweet, like it almost looks like Buffalo is trying to show that, you know, we can win games without Diggs. And I don't know if they yeah. look at it and say, and well, defense was dictating it. And it wasn't just the yards. He went from playing 80, 86% play time to like 60, 65% play time. So that was the thing that was alarming to me. Not only is he not just getting the yards, you're taking him off the field. He was off the field as I was watching film. He was off the field for like two of the first four third downs in one game. I'm like, it's third down. This guy dictates the defense on third down. Most teams play some man on third down. So all of those things that factor in, you look at those numbers, you're like, wow, like how does this just fall off? And then you watch the guy, and you're like, well, he still looks good. He's still moving well. He's still fast. So can, he, can he still so, be can he still be a dog in Houston? Do you think Stefan Diggs is still a number one guy dictating coverage? Can't leave him one-on-one against certain corners. Do you feel like he can still be that in Houston? Yeah, he can still win. And what I love about it is now you get a guy, to me, it's that it's that sweet spot in their career. They smart, they have experience, they have all those intangibles, and they still have a couple years left at elite athletic ability that they still have, maybe not as fresh when they're 24, 25 years old, but still can get it done. And now you mix that together, you get sometimes the best couple years of a player's career and to put that along with what he's going to bring to that room. Young Tank Dell, Nico Collins, they might have thought they were working hard on their individual craft, and then they might watch this guy work and see him <laughs> day in and day out, his work at it. Now all of a sudden you look up and your whole room has changed. I always tell people that's what Julian Edelman was in our wide receiver room. Was he going to be loud? Could he curse you out every once in a while? Could he cry like <laughs> a baby and Tom go at it? Yes. 
But at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, he's going to be in there catching tennis balls. Then he's going to be on the jugs machine catching. And you're going to come in there. If you're a young receiver, you walk in at 6.45, 7 a.m., Jules is coming out, cut T-shirt on, red gloves, and he's cursing you out like, where, where have you been? I just caught 250 balls, 500 balls. So, like, that to me raises the standard of everybody else in that room. So, to me, that that is an interesting thing. And now you flip to the other side. The Buffalo Bills just was like, yo, Diggs, ah, stiff arm, go that way. Derrick Henry type stiff arm. And now you look up at this wide receiver room, no Stephon Diggs, no Gabe Davis. And Shakir had a big year last year. I thought he was very productive for them. And you add Curtis Samuel, but you kind of look up and you're like, dang, we went from Josh Allen early in his career. Everybody kept saying they just got to get him better weapons. They just got to get him better weapons. You get these better weapons. Now it's just like, all right, well, that didn't work out. You know, like, is that the issue? And, and you yeah. know, I'm going to throw this to you because I, I heard something interesting. They were talking about Caitlin Clark uh, on the brother from another show. And Michael Smith said, sometimes dynasties deny your dreams. And it wasn't a knock on Caitlin Clark. It wasn't, oh, she should have done this. She should. She did everything possible. She ran into South Carolina, the dynasty that they are. Dawn Staley's going to keep winning. Are we going to look and be like, hey, yeah, Buffalo lost digs and all of that. But at the end of the day, are we going to just say, hey, it wasn't Josh Allen's fault. It wasn't Diggs' fault. They just ran into Patrick Mahomes the same way some of the Colts teams ran into Tom Brady, the same way some of those Eastern Conference teams ran into jo to Jordan uh, and Chicago. Like, is that going to be more of the story for Buffalo than anything? Hey, a man is somewhere saying like, hell, slow down now. I got, I, I got my rings too. I may not have won all of them, but I got some of them in there. Don't say Jordan. Seven, but that's seven. true. That's true. Um, that's that's the New England Patriot in you. I, I look at it as if I'm the Buffalo Bills, like, yes, obviously Mahomes, Kansas City, the dynasty, you can go into that. You go back to the 13 seconds. You go back to Stephon Diggs' last career target as a Buffalo Bill, assuming he doesn't go back to the Bills. It was a drop bomb that if he catches that, that changes the game versus the Kansas City Chiefs. So, yes, you can look at it as the Chiefs just overwhelmed them. They were too much. But they've beaten the Kansas City Chiefs in the regular season. So they're a team that they know they can do it. They just haven't gotten over the hump when it mattered most. And I think that's the most defeating or deflating feeling for this Buffalo Bills team is you feel like you've gotten the best out of Josh Allen, the best out of Stephon Diggs, and you've still fallen short for whatever given reason that you felt like we had enough to win that game. And I look at this now where we talked about Mahomes winning a Super Bowl two years in a row without a guy like Tyreek Hill. So now Josh Allen, a guy who wasn't able to get it done with a guy like Stefan Diggs, you can blame whoever you want to blame. You can blame Sean McDermott. You can blame Josh Allen. You can blame the defense, whatever pick you take your pick. But at the end of the day, you lose a guy like Stefan Diggs and everything you just said about him in that wide receiver room as he's being a, becoming an addition to Houston. Well, now he's now a subtraction of that room in the buff for the Buffalo Bills, him and Gabe Davis. Now they brought in a guy like Matt Collins. I was teammates with Matt Collins. He's not going to be the number one receiver and put up these crazy numbers, but he's a guy whose presence in a room, he's a dog on special teams. So he's a guy that's going to trash talk and uplift an entire room. No matter who's in your room, if you don't have enough talent, though, Khalil Shakira went off towards the end of the year of making big catches and big moments for them. Curtis Samuel, a speed guy, you bring him in for Washington. I would assume with the 28th pick that they're going to go wide receiver to try to replace Diggs. Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, two really good tight ends. I will see a lot of 12 personnel. And then also part of it that I think we're kind of missing out on is we're focusing on a wide receiver room and Diggs and his production. When Joe Brady took over as offensive coordinator, they decided, you know what? Let's use this running back we drafted out of Georgia, James Cook. And you know what? Our quarterback's an alien. Let's let him run the ball. And that's what we saw from them as they went on that run was they ran the ball a lot more and were comfortable running the ball. That last playoff game, Josh Allen only threw for, I think, 180-something yards. So it wasn't him of the old school where he just had to go all out and running, jumping over people, throwing bombs. It was like, no, we're going to commit to the run. We're going to go 12 personnel with two tight ends in the game and figure out how to be productive from that standpoint and protect the football and that's how they started winning games so from their theory it may be like hey we can add another receiver but really rely on some of the guys that have already showed us that they can get the job done uh on the other side of our ears right now james convinced me who you were talking to before we jumped on the show 
He's so happy to see this because he's sitting here and he's like, the Jets will win the AFC East now. It is our time. Aaron Rodgers is back. Jets They got linemen. Celebrate. <laughs> What'd you say? They got linemen. They got offensive linemen that they feel like their quarterback can play beyond four plays this year. Pat, Pat's Nation is going to hate me. I'm going out on a limb. Jets win AFC East this year. Aaron Rodgers return. Mm -mm. I'm all here for it. Throw mm -mm. them back on hard knocks. No, nah, I'm 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 rolling with Miami to win a division. I'm not just going to assume that Aaron Rodgers Miami, 40 years old. Won, Miami's not going to beat Buffalo. Fresh, fresh off, fresh off an Achilles. I'm not going to assume that now they just hit the ground running. They just pick up right where they left off, and they just absolutely win that division. I'm not rolling that fast. I do love that Brees, Brees Hall now will be 100% healthy, but I still think there's some factors you got to work through. I mean, the offense obviously without Aaron Rodgers was dreadful. He'll be back there, but we all like can I can I see him play first? Just even if it's a snap in the preseason, let me just see him back out there in action first before I deem him and crown him the AFC's champions. Like. Come Come on now. So do you see do you see Houston now in that kind of AFC conference title game or is it still Cincinnati with Joe Burrow hopefully getting the full offseason healthy and then coming into training camp healthy? Is it Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens back to finish the job? Yeah. I mean, this AFC is going. I mean, last year we talked about it and it was like, this is going to be a juggernaut. Teams are not going to get into Aaron Rodgers gets hurt. He goes down kind of changes the AFC East and turns into really a two-team race instead of a three-team race. So all of these different factors come in. Tennessee, new head coach in there with Callahan. So it's just so many things that are happening. I know one of the teams we talked about last night, even as a team like Cleveland, like was Deshaun Watson going to turn the page and kind of get back to the old 2019-ish Deshaun Watson and, and then be in um, – I don't want to ride just the wave of like the Houston makes this move, but the way they played last year. And then the, I think Nick Casario deciding, Hey, we're going to be aggressive this year. For me, I can easily see them in a conference championship game playing to compete and, and have a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Well, before the Stefan Diggs acquisition, I already was saying everybody's going to, the Texans are going to be the popular like dark horse Super Bowl team as we like to come up with all these frames, at these claims, X Factor and all of those. They're going to be the dark horse Super Bowl team. When I look at the AFC, the AFC North is just unbelievable. You mentioned Joe Burrow, you mentioned Lamar Jackson, you mentioned Deshaun Watson. Well, now we got Justin Fields and Russell Wilson in the division as well. So them there in the AFC North, they beat up on each other so much that now with Burrow health, it's hard to say who's going to come out of there. I also look at the Chargers. Jim Harbaugh being back there, the one thing that we've seen from Harbaugh, when he got to the 49ers in his first NFL stint, they won right away. They, he got there, and they won double-digit games. So I don't want to assume that him getting there with a quarterback like Justin Herbert. I know Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, another team when you talk about a depleted wide receiver room. They have the number five pick, though. They're going to be able to get if they want, possibly, depending upon what happens with the quarterbacks, they could possibly get a Marvin Harrison or a neighbor, somebody of that nature. They're going to get a big-time receiver. He's shown that he can win right away. But whenever you're talking about the AFC, I, I've learned over the last two years since I've embarked on my sports media career, bro, just talk about the Chiefs. Like, don't, don't do yourself a disservice and come on here and try to be smart and come up and say, oh, this team did that. Well, this acquisition, well, Stephon Diggs is going to be the X factor in the AFC. He changes the whole thing. Well, Lamar Jackson takes another... The answer is Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey. Both of those guys are still playing. They're opening up steakhouses. Andy Reid is still eating cheeseburgers. Like until something changes in Kansas City, right now we're talking AFC. I, it's just there was a point during that season they lose on Christmas to the Raiders, and I'm like, there's no way this Kansas City Chiefs team is winning a Super Bowl. They just they don't have it. They gave up 14 points offensively, a pick six, a fumble return for a touchdown. And then Mahomes is hoisting the Lombardi trophy and I'm sitting in the stands watching. Like, I, I don't understand how this guy is still doing it at this level, taking his team down, driving, throwing a touchdown pass to McCole Hardman to win Super Bowl. 50. So it, it, I just, I can't go against, I can't go against the Kansas back to back champions. Who knows? Maybe they're the ones to do a three peat. Yeah. I mean, speaking of that, that Mahomes mystique, Kansas city reminds me of a team that I used to play for the new England Patriots and what they were able to do. 
What? That's dead. The the di- you didn't like the dynasty. Dynasty's dead. No, no reminding of Patriots. Like nobody wants to talk Patriots. Hey, it's okay. I know you want to ride the Kansas City train because you were all over the Netflix quarterback series of this Kansas City <laughs> Chiefs team. They had your voice and stuff, and they were, people were tweeting you like, "Oh boy, was he wrong?" So I get it. You don't want to go down this road. Well, I need. No I need. Was- I need my. Re- I need my residuals for my appearance on there too. It, I, <laughs> my voice was on there a few times, so I need a little bit more money from that. I gave them motivation too. I'm. I'm talking about the Patriots because that's what we about to jump into next. The Patriots. Patriots are one of the few teams that got a new coach that started this this week. The Patriots, the Panthers, the Titans, the Seahawks all began offseason workouts this this week, um, starting off on Monday. But I thought the interesting thing was the Patriots, because obviously you lose Coach Belichick and he moves on. And now all eyes are on you and everybody was like, all right, this offseason is about to be crazy. We're going to do all of these non-Belichick things. Mayo comes out and he's like, we going to burn money, baby. And it was like, whoa, hey, what's about to happen? And all they do is they just retain player after player after player from the previous regime, which made fans say, yo, we're 4-13. We don't want those 4-13 guys. But what I thought was interesting, my time being in New England, all I used to hear was you build through the draft. You draft your core players, and they stay, and they become the guys who take your franchise on. And it was very awesome for me to go into that franchise behind the Teddy Brewskis, behind the Ty Laws, to behind the Willie McGinnises, the Richard Seymours, the Tom Brady's, even though I played with Tom Brady, the Logan Mankins, the Vince Wilfers, like all of these guys, when you got there, you were like, man, I want to be like them. So mm-hmm. I thought this was a piece of that. It was, hey, Michael Owenu, he showed out to be a good guard and a really good tackle. And we think, his best position might just be staying at right tackle. We're going to pay him. Kyle Duggar is a guy that we got. He showed to be a stud. He's made splash plays. He's continuing to grow. We're going to invest in him. We're going to invest in Josh Uche. We're going to invest in Anthony Jennings. We're going to decide that, hey, we're not going to have these classes that we draft. And then three or four years later, the whole class is gone. And that mm-hmm. happened a few years in a row. And we were talking last night. Let's give Coach Belichick. Let's give Bill his flowers. Because these guys that they have retained, they are Bill Belichick's draft picks. The guy that everyone says can't draft, these are the guys that they're keeping. So for us to really give them his flowers, these guys need to make sure they go and produce now that they didn't keep them for no reason. But I think it was an interesting strategy of if we're going to build this thing back up the way we want it to be, the way that we've done it in years past, it has to be through the draft. We tried 2021. We went out there. We broke records. We spent all of this money. And two years later, we were not in the playoffs. Another year later, we were one of the worst teams in NFL. Like, we're done with that. We're not moving in that direction. So it's, it's felt like Gerard Mayo and Elliot Wolf have come together and said, hey, this is who we are. Take it or leave it. We're not going to adapt and change and do something that won't win us games. We're going to be who we are. And I think those are the question marks that you're saying. Like, all right, you kept some of your homegrown talent. Is different than your version of the Patriots or the version of the Patriots that came before you because when you were keeping your homegrown talent, you were keeping guys that had you in AFC Championship games, that had you in Super Bowls, that were returning after already winning Super Bowls and having their rings and being a part of ring ceremonies and parades and all of those things. The guys that they're bringing back now, really good players and Big Mike and Duggar, those guys haven't been able to realize the success that some of you guys saw. So from a fan's perspective, they're looking at it like, all right, well, this is great. We're paying these guys. They're going to help us win. But do we have enough to win? Because to your point, like these picks have hit. But then there's the guys that before, the Nikhil Harris, the Jawan Williams, the Chase Winovich, those guys who didn't get second contract with the Patriots that you look at and say, well, when these younger guys came in, you didn't have those guys to show them the way that the, all the players that you just mentioned were there to show you the rope. So I look at them and I talked about this on Good Morning Football where Mayo gets there and he says, we're going to burn through cash. And it's like that young kid, you're in your, you're in your early 20s and you're sitting there and for years you've heard dad just continue to preach these things to you and all you're thinking about is like dad i hear you but when i get out on my own i'm getting bottle service i'm at the club i'm going on vacation i am going to live it up and then as soon as you buy your own apartment you get that first you see what the first month's rent is and security like 
I got to pay all of this right now. Then the utility bill hits and then you got a car note insurance. You're just like, damn, man, I, I got to slow down, man. I got a date this week and I thought we were going to Ruth Chris, but we're going to have to pull up and maybe hit like Kava and just grab a quick bite to eat and just, just have a, a, a great conversation. I want her to get to know me. And that's what it felt like for the Patriots. Like, all right, free agency started. You're know, going to go, go out and get all of these guys in. Yes, they got KJ Osborne. They got Antonio Gibson. They signed some of their guys. Kendrick Bourne, guys of that nature. But it wasn't this huge upgrade. And I think some of it is you got to figure out who's going to be your quarterback. I would assume with the number three pick is going to be either Drake May or Jaden Daniels that they decide to invest in unless we see something crazy happen on draft day. Because – None else matters. And I think Jacoby Brissett is a perfect guy for them to come in and help be a leader in that room. We watched how he handled himself in Cleveland there. I was with him when he was a backup to Tua in Miami where he had to play. And then we saw glimpses when he actually played in Washington last year where they were putting up points and the team was moving better than when Sam Howell was in there. So I look at the Patriots. I still think they're going to be the worst team in the division. There's still a lot to be desired from them. But you bring in Gerard Mayo. Mayo brings in his own set of coaches. I think there's a youth movement going on there from a coaching staff. There's a ton of energy. And now, to your point, it's about building for the future. Fans, how patient they're going to be, how patient Kraft's going to be, those are the questions. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things is because I love talking Patriots. Right? I got my helmet in the background. But what I've learned in TV and media stuff is when a team wins four games, you could give them a quick segment, but we can't stay too long. And I think, as we mentioned, some of those newer teams, you were on the Tennessee Titans, you played with the Titans, but you also had a unique experience. Your time in Tennessee, eight years. How many new head yep. coaches? Man, I mean, we had, I think, four, four, four different head coaches. So in eight this years, year. you have four, yep. four head coaches. Yeah. So we talked about these new teams, starting off-season program. What, what was that like? I never had to experience that. I had the same coach all 13 years. What is that like when a new coach comes in for one year off season gets cut short, either by one week or two weeks, depending on when they want to start. Did you like that? Was the new energy like we're going to go win? Or was it kind of like after the second and third coach, like, man, we back at this again. Like, hurry up. Let's move on. Let's lose all these games and then come back and do it again next year. No, it's newfound hope. I mean, Think about it from a perspective of you're married now, but at some point you were in some bad relationships where you were struggling and you wanted to get out of the relationship, but you didn't want to seem like the, me, you didn't want to <laughs> you didn't want to seem like the bad guy. But eventually the relationship ends, and next thing you know, you meet this new girl and she just seems fantastic. And that's what the new coaches come along because you're just like, Well, the way we were doing it, that wasn't it. So this new guy is obviously coming off somewhere being a hot shot coordinator or having done it before. So I go from Jeff Fisher to to Mike Munchak, to Ken Wizahunt, to Mike Malarkey within those eight years. And whenever a new coach comes in, all the signs that you had before, they all come off the wall. New signs go up. There's usually a Lombardi trophy somewhere. Start with the goal, the end goal in mind, and all of the different sayings that once you lose and the next coach comes in, they rip them all down to the point where – Mike Munchak takes over and Munch, like I'm, I'm a big Munch fan. He was a, one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL for a while. And Munch comes in and Munch played for the Oilers. He coached for the Titans. So he had been a part of the organization for 30 plus years. He puts up on one long wall we had in the hallway, this whole tradition of where the Titans started to from all the way from the Oilers days, all the way to the Tennessee Titans of pictures and different people that have laid bricks for it. Awesome wall. Munchak gets fired. Wizard Hunt comes in. He takes the whole damn wall down. I'm like, what's the wall got to do? The history of the organization. What's that got to do with right now? So like that to me was always the annoying part. Yes, there was newfound hope. You had to learn new coaches. There's the dog and pony part of it too. Like the new coach would come in and off season would hit. And it's just like, well, I should go up to the facility and go introduce myself to the coach. And you're trying to like say the right thing, but you don't really know what to say. The film speaks for itself. So that part of it's annoying, but there is, there is legitimately newfound hope because whoever comes in is supposed to be light years better than what you had before. But as we know, in this business, change is constant and it doesn't always hit. So there are coaches that are going to come in and as soon as they put their signs up, everybody else in the building, the guys that are working and women that are working, they're coming down. They're peeling all of those ones off the, off the walls and they're putting something new up. So it is a different experience. Starting early was never fun. I remember it was it was literally 10 years ago to this month that we started with Ken Wizhunt because I got married that same month and had to <laughs> push my honeymoon back a week so that it matched up with our off-season workouts and the week that we had off. So 
it is an adjustment, but it's, I mean, you think about it for these teams, you talk about the Titans, you talked about the Seahawks, you're talking about the Panthers teams that didn't play well. And now you're like, all right, like, what does this guy have to bring to the table? That's going to get, everybody just wants to win. Players want to win to get paid. Coaches want to win. We all want to win, win championships and all that. If you bring somebody in that's going to help us do that. We're all for it. For it yeah. And the interesting to me is uh, of all of these four teams, three teams, the Patriots, the Seahawks and the Titans. You're backing up, and I know the Titans, Vrabel didn't win a Super Bowl, but Vrabel took team a Tennessee yeah. team to the AFC Championship that I think everybody was like, whoa. Like, wh- like, how is Tennessee really not just in the AFC Championship, but leading and beating Kansas City at the half and looking like they were for half about to go to a Super Bowl? And then you have True. the legendary Pete Carroll, what he did at USC, then goes to Seattle – Puts this team in the 2013 Super Bowl, then the next year they're right back in the Super Bowl. So to me, that's always interesting. And then obviously with Gerard May on the Patriots, Bill Belichick's resume speaks for itself. Following up these coaches who have had success and not just success like 40 years ago, they've had success all within a relative relative time of maybe being in a big playoff games, maybe being in mm-hmm. the Super Bowl, maybe even winning a Super Bowl, like Bill Belichick 2018 season, he won a Super Bowl. Like, you're following up these things. And I always sit there and I'm like, well, what is what buys these coaches another year after each year? What do they need to do? Because if they win nine games and they lose in a wild card, these franchises in the last few years, they've done that. They've been in the big game. So they're like, hey, this isn't good enough. We wanted you to win right away. If you're Mike McDonald, hey, you were in Baltimore. You had this great defense. So if your defense isn't top five, does that get you fired? Is that not good enough? You know, you come in and you're trying to figure things out. You're in Tennessee. You had Derrick Henry. You had this great running game. So if, like, we can't run the ball or because we drafted Will Levis and we only still run the ball, is that – so I'm always so intrigued by these teams who have had success that hasn't been – the Carolina yeah. Panthers would have been, you know, at the bottom for a while. So for Canales, you come in and you get to try to, you know, just do something that they just haven't seen be done in a while. Now you're trying to kind of do something brand new. And I shouldn't say that. The Panthers had Cam Newton. They had some success. They won the Super Bowl as well. Um, but I think ever since then, when Cam Newton left and those yeah. different things, it hasn't been the same. But I just sit there and I'm like, for these coaches, the weight that's on your shoulders day in and day out, like – how do you manufacture and get that moving? And then what I wonder, like, what does the owner tell them? Like, hey, you got two years, buddy, and I want to be in this game. It's, I, it's, it always blows me away when we see these new coaches, guys like Steve Wilkes goes to Arizona, terrible really team, takes over. They give them a year and then they fire. Like, I, I'm just like, it's such a it's such a tough business to be in. But when you do well, it pays well. So I, I fully understand. It, it comes with the territory, and part of it is 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 different for each coach. To your point, for you think about Callahan in Tennessee, like you got to develop Will Levis. If there's no progression from Levis, same with Canales, with Bryce Young. If we don't see anything from these two quarterbacks, their improvements, especially Tennessee, where you go out and you get Calvin Ridley, you got DeAndre Hopkins on the outside. Like we got to start to see what these guys can do at that quarterback position to have some belief that all right, you're the right guy for it. For a McDonald, you think about you come in and you said it. If I'm a defensive quarterback. Coordinator, the one thing I can't have is a bad defense as a head coach. I have to make sure that that thing is flourishing. And then for Mayo, I, I think it always hits different when you're hired from within the organization because you're coming in right away with all your ideas of what needs to be done to make it better. To your point, I remember when Malarkey took over for Wizard Hunt in Tennessee, he had notebooks of the things that he felt like we could improve right now and get better because he would been in the building for the last year and a half. I think the same goes for Mayo. You're looking at it and you have instant things when you're going through the process. There's something that Crab heard from Mayo, saw from Mayo, where he's like, all right, he's going to be able to correct the things that have been broken for us for these last few years where we haven't been able to get to where we were at one point. So I think for each coach, it's a different measuring stick that you have to live up to. No, that's so true. And I think for each guy, they're going to figure out does this work? Does this not work? And it, I think the key thing in the NFL is patience. How patient is that team going to be with that specific head coach? We've seen some teams, Carolina, <laughs> Dave, David Tepper has not been patient. He's been getting rid of guys left and right. Yep. That doesn't mean he has to continue down that train. He can decide, hey, I really like Canales. I want to be patient with this coach. So, uh, And I think even with that patience, we were talking 
uh, before we got on, and we were just talking about the draft and all the craziness that happens. A team that I can see something where it's like, oh, I, oh, I, 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 I just can't believe they did that. I think of the Miami Dolphins. What if the Miami Dolphins find a way to, whether it's staying where they are, training, what if they find a way and they say, you know what, we like left-handed quarterbacks, but the left-handed quarterback we have right now, his rookie deal is about to be up. We love that we have talent everywhere. Jalen Waddle's contract is going up. I'm like, well, what if they're like, hey, Michael Penix, come on. We want to work with you now. Tua, this is not a disservice to you. It's not discrediting what you've done. We just don't want to pay that kind of money. We don't want to do kind of what the Giants did and pay Daniel Jones. Mm -hmm. And then we feel like, you know, he's a really good quarterback in our system, but we don't feel like he's an X factor. Like you used that word earlier. What if they say, hey, Michael Penix, we want to take a chance on you, whether you become an X factor or not. Maybe it matters. Maybe it does. But we're going to use you while you're on your rookie deal. and We're going to keep all of this talent around you and we're going to keep building yeah. that way. That is Miami's a team. And I'm just very interested because I think nowadays in NFL, some of the better GMs are very proactive in what is coming up. They, they try to get ahead of it. They try to do different things. And, you know, we talk about Daniel Jones, but on the other side of the defensive ball for the Giants, they gave Dexter Lawrence a new contract very early and avoided some of the craziness of the defensive tackle market. So I just think that Miami and Chris Green, it, it might, I wouldn't be super, I would be surprised, but I wouldn't be like blown out of my seat of if they come up and they say, you know what, we want to take a quarterback and we want to try to build this and keep going the foundation the way we have it with a rookie quarterback salary instead of paying to a big money because Tua has earned that. His numbers, everything speaks for itself. He will be crazy not to try to demand that. Of course. And I can't remember whose mock draft it was that I saw that had Miami stand put. I think they're at 21 drafting Michael Penix. And it is an interesting thought process because you reset the clock again. You get another rookie quarterback contract. You can probably pay Jalen Waddle. You can surround the pieces. I would be floored. And the reason I would be floored is since Mike McDaniel has gotten there, Everybody from the Miami Dolphins, from Chris Greer to Mike McDaniel, have raved about Tua Tagovailoa as their quarterback. They've talked about we want to get a contract done with him this offseason. There's never seemed to be any doubt. Even a year ago where he goes through the injuries, he's not able to finish the season. They were fully committal to him in the offseason and everything Tua did to his credit with the jujitsu and the different things. He played in every single game this year and was productive for them. Hey man, so what they, if he just want, what if he just wants too much money that they're like, hey, we love you, but we're we just not paying you yet. Crazier things have happened in the NFL, to your point, especially with the draft. We never know what exactly is going to happen. I'm just saying I would be floored just from I'm basing off the way they've talked about him for years, not just this past year or just for years, the way they've talked about Tua since they brought him in. And you mentioned the Giants. To me, I think the obvious answer with the draft, the wildcard teams, the Vikings made a trade that got them an extra pick from Houston. Yeah. They're a team that is uh, that could possibly move up to get a quarterback. They're in need of one. You look at the Broncos and the Raiders sitting at 12 and 13. What the hell are they going to do to get a quarterback? The Raiders brought in Minshew, but we all know the connections from Jaden Daniels to Antonio Pierce, that Pierce was a coach at Arizona State when Jaden Daniels was there, recruited him and got him there for the Broncos. We Russell Wilson is now a Pittsburgh Steeler. We know our guy Jared Stidham is on the roster right now, who I guess is the de facto starting quarterback. And then Ben DiNucci is the backup to him. Those guys have started five career games in the NFL. So you look at those teams and you're like, well, all right, what are they going to do at the quarterback position? The Giants at six are intriguing too, because we had these discussions where Giants fans got mad at me for saying, I don't see the Giants going for a quarterback with that pick, no matter what happens, because a guy like J.J. McCarthy. We've seen him go from number two all the way to we don't know where he's going to go in the first round. If, if J.J. McCarthy's sitting there at six, do the Giants pull the trigger and get him knowing that Daniel Jones' contract after this year is just no more guaranteed money? That, to me, is an intriguing one because you don't know which way it's going to go. I look at it and I think they go and they select somebody that's going to make their team better right now, possibly a receiver to help Daniel Jones on the outside. But that, to me, is interesting because 
who knows? And John Mara, the owner, already said, like, hey, I'm giving those guys the ability, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, to do what they do, and I'm going to support them either way. But he did say he feels that Daniel Jones will get back to the level he played at in 2022. What Don't you love if your boss tells you that? Hey, I support whatever you do, but I'm but just I like saying. Him. But I like I him. Like him. I like him a lot. So <laughs> if you get rid of him, and I told you I like him. You better be don't right. Get, don't get mad if I pick up my phone. I'm like, Bill Belichick? Is it you? you? Like, hey, you you just don't know. But I, I do want to I do want to do something that's been fun. We've done this a couple different times. Is Diggs goes to Houston, and obviously he adds to that room, right? Nico Collins, Tank Dell, and now Stephon Diggs. So we've kind of we've done different. Like, hey, rank your guys, and we talked about it. We do a top three of the top wide receiver rooms. But instead of like you do your top three and I do my top three, so when people see the graphic, they're gonna be mad. But like, let's draft where if I, if you take a, a uh, group, then I can't take a group. So we go back and forth, and we end up with let's call it the top six guy, top six receiver rooms. Because if not, you, me and you are probably gonna end up with very similar lists, and that's no fun. We're I like already that. twins. People hate when we dress the same when we say the same thing at the same time. Like that's never cool. So let's go. I was gonna say since you're the guest, you go first. But since it's home field advantage, since I have multiple championships. I think I should decide on who goes first, and I'm feeling I'm feeling myself today, so I'm going to say I go first, and I'm going to say the number one pick. If I'm going to take a team and a group, I'm taking the Cincinnati Bengals, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins. I'm going to take them first. That's going to be my first pick in the draft. Go ahead, J-Mac. Who you got? I, I think it's unbelievable that you decided to invite me on this podcast and still decided to go first. I'm going to go... And obviously this team didn't finish the way you would expect them to finish when they were 10 and one last year, but I'm going with the Eagles. I'm going with AJ Brown, Devontae Smith. I think those two guys walking thousand yards are unbelievable. And they're both different. You got uh swole Batman, skinny Batman, and they figure it out. They've lost fat Batman and Jason Kelsey, but he wasn't catching any pass. So I'm rolling with those two guys in that receiver room in Philly. Yeah. He wasn't catching any passes, but I don't know if they'll ever see a touch like that again. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go here. With my second, my second pick, I'm going to go with a group that I had to play before I leave in New England in the AFC uh -oh. East. Going the Miami Dolphins. I'm going speed, speed, greasy speed. When you hang 70 on somebody, Jason Garrett talked about it all year. Anytime he had a chance to talk about it, he talked about the fastest show on grass, the Miami Dolphins, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle. I mean, it's just over and over again. The guys are so productive. I even like, I know it's not a wide receiver, but I like that they even added John New Smith. Guys, wide receiver type speed. He'll be another guy True. that they can go and use in different ways that I think might open up more space, which would be scary for Tyree Hill and Jalen Waddle. I like that. And to your point, it's just speed everywhere. And the crazy thing with these teams is like, Tyler Boyd is no longer in Cincinnati. Who's going to be Philly's third receiver? Same thing in Miami. Craig Kraft was there. Like, who's the third guy? And we mentioned in Houston, Texas. What I like is they have the three guys. But for my next one, I'm going with the Rams. And a lot of it has to do with Sean McVay of being such a mastermind at the offensive position of being able to craft things up. I know Cooper Cup was banged up in and out of the lineup last year, but what Puka Nakua did, when you look at rookie records and there's Jefferson, there's Odell Beckhams, there's Jamar Chase's on there and then Puka Nakua's name is at the very top of that list, I think that is unbelievable. It speaks volumes of a fifth round draft pick out of BYU. I played with his older brother, Kai Nakua, it was the Cleveland Browns, but I think this team has a chance, especially with Matthew Stafford, who got right back to form last year. It was in the, in the playoff game in Detroit, fell short, but I'm rolling with them as a wide receiver group. I'm going to be a gentleman. I'm going to let you pick uh, your next pick before I pick my last pick. Oh. You go with your number three. And if you want to list, if you want to list a couple that just missed, don't, don't be afraid to do that. Why well, actually well, do that a, after, after I go? Uh, you just the, 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 Okay, the team that I'm rolling with, my third one, I'm going to stick right there in Houston. And I'm going to say 
Diggs, Nico Collins, and Tank Dell. And I'm saying them because I like them as a trio. I think they're going to be able, Nico Collins probably be on the outside, but between Tank Dell and Stephon Diggs, you're going to see those guys inside, outside. There's going to be so many different things that Bobby Sloat, the offensive coordinator, can come up with to get these guys the ball and get it in their hands. And to me, the fun part about them is they didn't have a Stephon Diggs last year. And Nico Collins just absolutely went off. A guy that kind of just jumped on the radar and took off. So I'm rolling with the Houston Texans. I'm 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 rolling a little bit with what's hot right now of what they've been able to do. I'm not mad at that. And I'm my next group, I'm going with a non-big name group, but I think it's it's the whole room in totality. I'm going the Green Bay Packers. I wow. think this group, yes, I think this group, and I'm gonna name some other teams that just missed that I think have unbelievable wide receiver groups. But the reason I'm going Green Bay is. I enjoy what they're able to do. You can't just come out and say, we're going to stop Christian Watkins or we're going to come out and stop Romeo Dobbs. Who, who is Bo Melton? Out of nowhere, you look up, Bo Melton's having 100-yard games. He's going out there and he's producing. So I think this group overall, they just have a ton of different guys that they can throw at you. They had guys that were on the practice squad that you look up and they were out there playing. They were productive. So I'm just excited to see. And I think one of the biggest things is it's because of Jordan Love. The guy is an unbelievable quarterback. I remember coming in this year at NBC and talking to Chris Sims, and Chris Sims was like, I I'm mad at myself because I was going to put Jordan Love, I think it was like in his top five of quarterbacks coming in 2023 season. He's like, but I let like everybody else's scrutiny and what they were telling me to get <laughs> in the way of me not just going with what I saw and what I believe, and the guy's an absolute stud. So – I just really I, I enjoy that room and some other rooms that I think are are absolutely I mean you look at I think one of the teams nobody talks about Seattle I think you look at Lockett you look at DK Metcalf you yeah. look at Jackson Smith and Jigba the thing for them is you know they they have to continue to produce and, and it's about being in the big games you know I think for them and then I think the other team that easily could be my number three team would be the Minnesota Vikings with Jordan Addison and then with yeah. the best receiver in football. Justin Jefferson. So kill me all you want, Minnesota fans. There's no doubt about it. Justin Jefferson and Addison could easily be that number three team. I, I get it. I get it. But I wanted to jump out on the limb a little bit. No doubt about it. The 49ers didn't get mentioned with Ayuk and Debo Samuel. Then obviously George Kittle's a tight end, but that's a huge receiving threat for them as well. So there are some other guys, a newcomer, Calvin really being matched up with DeAndre Hopkins on the outside, the Cleveland Browns, Jerry Judy. Now you have Amari Cooper, you have Elijah Moore in the slot as well. So there are a lot of teams that have some really good wide receivers that about, you just kind of got to wait team, and see how it shakes out. How about the team you said last night, depending on, who they draft after they draft their quarterback first. The Chicago Bears. I mean, you get Keenan Allen, who was over 1,200 yards. DJ Moore was a stud for Justin Fields last year. And who knows? All right, they pick first, they get Caleb Williams. The number nine pick, everybody's mentioned Romo Dunze. If they get somebody like that as well, I mean, is there going to be a better trio in the league? You heard Keenan Allen say, I couldn't take a pay cut. Well, for 1,200 yards. So there's still a lot of production. It's hard to put them there not knowing what you're going to get from the rookie quarterback. But there's a lot, man. Yeah, man. And, and just segue a little bit, talking about the draft and Caleb Williams and Aduzier. Top 30 visits. That's all you've seen this week. Like, this is kind of like the dead period. Like, everything stops. There's no more – there's no combine. There's no pro days, all of that. Yeah. So then, like, you jump on Twitter, you see all the insiders are like, so-and-so's at a top 30 visit, so-and-so. And I thought it was interesting of, like, a top 30 visit. What, like – what, like, if I'm the normal fan sitting at home, what the heck is a top 30 visit? What do you do there? And I thought it was so interesting because – when I went on mine, I, I wrote them down. I tried to think back of like, all right, what, where did I go? And I went to St. Louis. I went to Dallas. I went to the two local ones, the Jets and Giants. Um, uh, did I say Cleveland, San Diego at the time? So I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll go to Dallas. It's this huge group, this beautiful dinner. They took us to the stadium. It was just Cleveland was sat down with the coaches, saw the facility. San Diego, same thing, sat down with the coach. It was just so different, and I was just like, you know what? These guys don't, they don't know what to expect. Some guys go in a full suit. I remember being a player and, and being a veteran and walking through the locker room. I see guys button up in their suit. Then some guys Did you come wear on. Some? No, I didn't. I wore a polo though. I had buttons on there, came button up. Then other guys come on there, you know, jeans, especially NIL. 
big chains everywhere. And I was just like, what if there was a what if there was a blueprint of what your top 30 visit is going to be like? And I know agents have a good, you know, kind of index and Rolodex of, hey, this team's kind of like this. This team's kind of like that. But I think it's such a nerve wracking experience because for these top 30 visits, you're not going to really you're not going to work out, but you're going to be in there. Sometimes coaches are going to sit down with you on my Dallas visit. We sat down. We got on the board. He was showing me this defense. We were doing this. Then I went all throughout the day, met more people. Then at the end of the day, we met again. He was like, hey, remember that defense I taught you? Draw that defense up. I remember sitting there like, dang, is this going to be the reason I don't get drafted? Is this only going to stay with Dallas? Are they going to tell the rest of the league? And not knowing if you did well, if you didn't do well, you're trying to remember, but you're so excited being there. So I just think it's such a crazy thing. And I think the top 30 visits are different for everybody. I was a guy that it was rumored to be maybe a late first rounder, maybe a second or third rounder. But then there's these guys that you know you're going in the top 10. So you might be more relaxed on your top 30 visit. And then there's other guys like you that no combine invite, none of that stuff. So you're like, I don't even know why I'm here. They probably not drive them anyway. I'm just trying to see if somebody will give me a tryout for a job. So it, it's it's crazy. I wouldn't, go that, I wouldn't go that I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't uh, try out for a job. Uh, oh, for, sorry, to your sorry. point, though. That's the crazy thing about the top 30 visits is it's a range. And like you said, you'll be on there with a group of people. For me, I wasn't on there. I don't think anybody that was on any of mine, I went on seven of them were first round draft picks. And a lot of mine, because I didn't go to the combine, was people needed to get a medical on me. We just need to send you to our doctor's office to do MRIs and all of those different things, just in case we do decide to draft you. But it is a nerve wracking process. And you went out to nice dinners and stuff. I think we had like a $40, $40 voucher to order room service service up the night before and then as soon as we finished our visit you went straight to the airport and you get on a standby flight because you probably would finish early to get back home as soon as possible to keep training because hell you were trying to get drafted so I think the top 30 visit to your point is different for every single person and to a certain extent we get enamored like you just said because there's nothing else going on right now I went on seven of those visits. None of the seven teams I visited drafted me. The Tennessee Titans drafted me. And yes, it was the 203rd pick. So at that point, you might be looking at the draft board and just be like, (laughs) we're going with that guy. But I had never spoken to anybody on the Tennessee Titans. Never talked to Fisher, Bud Adams, nobody. So then I ended up getting there. Mike Reinfeld was the GM at the time that drafted me. And even my DB coach, Marcus Robertson, didn't speak to him before then. But he was like, I'm a fan of yours. I like you. I've been watching film. Kenny Britt, my college teammate, gets drafted there in the first round. He asked Kenny, what do you think about him? Kenny was like, he gave me a headache every single day in practice. That helped me get drafted there. So there's so many different variables. The one thing I would say to guys, man, go and enjoy the process. And I know as nerve wracking as it is, you do a top 30 visit. You're in a new city that you maybe have never visited before. You're in a brand new sometimes facility with all these different coaches and stuff just enjoy it and the draft is going to come where you're getting drafted is going to happen the work starts once you get to whatever building you're in and then you start to carve out a name for yourself yeah there's no doubt about it you have to enjoy it because it's gone just like that and I, I still remember mine when I went to San Diego I was watching film with the DB coach and he throws on Antonio Camardi, and Antonio Camardi's doing a cover two drill where he's sliding across, and then he's opening his hips, turning and running. Every time the ball comes, he's just putting one hand up in the air and catching the ball. And he was like, yeah, that's Crow. That's that's what Crow can do. And I'm like, damn. I can't. That's a starting, that's a starting quarterback. I, I can't do that. that. That is insane. So it was just funny. And at that time, he was already on the Jets, but he was just showing me elite film of what practice looks like and what they do um but it to me is such an interesting thing and you know i've kept you here i kept you here for a long time and i appreciate you we had a good time on here so last night everybody not everybody but most people were watching the national championship game and men's band college basketball for men's because you know we got to give the women their credit they they've been knocking Ooh. all the things out, out of the booth but uconn Is out there. Dan Hurley, son of, if you're from New Jersey, New York area, if you follow high school basketball, you know who Bob Hurley is. Bob Hurley coached Dan Anthony's, and he has 26 state titles. And if you played against St. Anthony's back in the day, you understand St. Anthony's was picking you up full court, 94 feet, (laughs) and they would go out there and they would play you and they would play you hard. And myself and Jason, we got the chance to play against St. Anthony's. Jay, was that our senior year or junior year? Senior year. Senior year. Our senior year, we go to Jersey City, 
and we're playing at St. Anthony's and St. Anthony's had this small gym and we're out there and we're fighting, we're hustling because we were kind of the same. We were just a, a talent level, well, a couple talent levels below St. Anthony's, <laughs> but we were the 94 feet, be aggressive, play you tough. And so it was just that kind of matchup and we're battling. They're scoring more than us at the time. It's still early in the game. And Bob Hurley goes to the official. He makes a call and the whole gym gets quiet and you hear him. You don't make that call in my gym. And you could hear a pin drop. We went on to lose that game by 27. I remember the newspaper for you young people, the newspaper. Buzzsaw. It said St. Joe's goes through a buzzsaw. And it was crazy. And I remember sitting there playing that game. J.R. Smith came to watch the game. And we're all like, oh, that's J.R. Smith. So all those things. But watching that UConn team last night, it was flashbacks. I was, I, I was in my living room sitting there, and I just moved. So that's why you see all of this. So I was in my empty living room. All we got is a couch in there. And I'm holding the ball. I'm scared to take the dribble. I'm like, yeah. Because it was just a flashback. It was nightmares of what they did to you. And big shout out Dan Hurley. I'm not even a UConn fan. I'm a Rutgers guy. And I do want to say Rutgers is killing it. They're coming up. Dylan Harper, Ace Bailey coming. So you be ready for that. But I will say, as a Jersey guy, I don't, I don't like rooting for UConn. We had battles with them Big East. But like Dan Hurley, such a legend in New Jersey, what he's done. It's, it was really cool to see that game last night back to back, even though it brought back some pretty rough memories. Yeah, it was awesome. And to your point, um, that game is definitely memorable. The thing that was crazy about St. Anthony's, I remember they did a documentary on them, and Bob Hurley would have all the kids sign a contract of what they were going to do, showing up to school, sitting in the first two rows of class, and then the work ethic that they had to have to continue to be on that basketball team. And he was a, a, at a school in the inner city that he was bringing kids in, and they believed in it. But what was crazy, we were football players, and we were out there on the basketball court. St. Anthony's had straight basketball players, but all of their players walked around looking like this with muscles everywhere. And I'm like, they look like they should be playing football. And to your point, they will overpower you and just demolish you over time. And it wasn't with a ton, like in our years, it wasn't with a ton of NBA players where they were ranked in the nation every single year as one of the uh, better uh, at high school basketball teams, top five. So it was insane. Kyle Anderson was a guy who's played in the NBA forever now that was on St. Anthony's after us. But there were so many guys. It was so much fun when you look back on those things. But watching that game last night, you're absolutely right. UConn just continued to just pour it on, pour it on, pour it on. And then next thing you know, the game's over. I mean, Edie still dropped some buckets. It's just he got shut down in the second half a little bit. So Purdue, hey, shout out to Purdue too. They got there. They were able to kind of – they got to the national championship. They had Drew Brees there. It was all fun, and it was just like, yeah, congrats on getting there. UConn took the uh, title home. And shout out. We was in the Big East at one point for Rutgers, so you got to kind of rep UConn when it's in there, which you could kind of be conflicted because now you're a Big Ten member. Yeah, I know. Back to back, you know. But I, I do want to say the, the, the cool thing about Bob Hurley, what made my whole high school basketball career – Jason and myself, we do a 5K walk slash run for sickle cell every year, and we do it in Jersey City. And we had Bob Hurley come one year, and he was shooting off the opening gun to get the race started and introduce ourselves. And I'm like, and we're both kind of like, hey, you probably don't remember us, but we were at St. Joe's, and we tell that story about what he did to the ref. And he goes, I remember you too. Freaking tenacious. All like, I had nightmares with you guys. And I think he was fabricating a little bit. No doubt but about that's it. A little that solidified my basketball career. Bob Hurley, has, Nate Smith, Hall of Famer. He he knew has who your, we were. Has your um has your wife ever seen any of your basketball stuff? Uh no, nah, she doesn't care. So that was maybe a year or two ago. Our old high school basketball coach, uh, Mike Doherty, shout out Mike Doherty. He sent us on digital your games and stuff. So I put on a game or two, and my wife is sitting there. She was just like, boy. The way you talk about basketball, I thought you were actually good. This is trash. Bro, it was it was so deflating for me as a husband and as a man, as your wife to sit there and talk about you. My only response was like, but I was good at football, though. Look where you at now. <laughs> I had I had nothing to give on the basketball, and I had to just take it. So uh, don't, don't show your wife any of your old high school basketball footage. It's not as good as you remember it, believe me. Even as you were watching the footage, you were like, dang. I, I, I was like, damn, that's rough. That's rough. Get him out of there. I, 
I appreciate you coming on Football Night in America. Hey, stay tuned. Jason will be breaking news sometime next week on Football Night in America. His plans for Good Morning Football, NFL Network, it'll all be coming soon. J-Mac, I appreciate you jumping on with me today. Thanks for having me, baby. Hey, whenever Jason Garrett's not there, replace him with another Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.